Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. Today is going to be the last video in our little Halloween series and let me tell you, I definitely saved the best for last because this story is just so bizarre and completely unexplainable. When I first heard of this story, I had no idea what to think and the more I looked into the research, the more confused I got. I am so excited to hear your guys' thoughts on this story because I honestly just have no idea what to even think. With that being said, let's just get right into the video. Today, we are going to be talking about the Bennington Triangle. The Bennington Triangle is an area in the southwestern Vermont that is centered around the Gladstonbury Mountains and is made up of the towns Bennington, Woodford, Shaftesbury, and Somerset. The Bennington Triangle got its name from an author named Joseph A. Citro because of the bizarre and unexplained disappearances of at least five people or as many of 10 people between the years of 1945 and 1950 and as many as 30 in total. Now, Joseph A. Citro is an author and a lecturer on the unexplained phenomena in our world. This includes ghosts, the paranormal, spirits, aliens, and pretty much everything in between. He thinks that these bizarre disappearances could be attributed to some sort of unworldly phenomena. Now, before we get into the disappearances, let's talk about the area within the Bennington Triangle. This area has a pretty interesting history dating back as far as the 1700s. Glastonbury and Somerset were once both thriving, logging, mining, and industrial communities, but turned basically into a ghost town after they were abandoned at the end of the 19th century when the logging industry died down and they basically completely eroded the soil from so much logging. Then a massive flood came through the town and destroyed a lot of the railway and the townspeople basically just decided to leave and start over somewhere else. Now, most of Glastonbury is pretty much untouched and is just wilderness and is very secluded and remote. By 1937, the town was considered pretty much uninhabited, and according to the 2010 census, a whole eight people were reportedly living there. Now, the Native Americans in the area actually considered the Glastonbury Mountains cursed, and they only used it for burying those who have passed away. They told stories of hairy wild men and other strange creatures in the woods and said that the four winds met there in an eternal struggle. Because of this, they pretty much completely avoided the area altogether. Another interesting belief people had about this mountain is that it had an enchanted stone at the top of the mountain that could swallow a man whole. Apparently those who went to the top and stood on this rock were suddenly swallowed whole, never to be seen again. This area also has a history of a ton of strange occurrences dating all the way back to the 1800s. There have been reports of strange lights being seen in the sky, weird sounds with no explanations, and odd smells coming from the mountains. There's also thought to be a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch roaming around the area. Reports dating back to the early 19th century detailed a hairy monster that was over six feet tall. This monster had apparently rushed at a horse carriage and knocked it over on its side before fleeing and running back into the dark with a roar. Now, of course, all of these strange occurrences and phenomena can't really be proven. They are all pretty much just old wives tales or mystical stories that have been passed along the generations. It is very strange that these bizarre things happened as far back as the 1800s, but we don't necessarily know how true they are. However, there is a very real and very scary phenomena happening in this area. The Bennington Triangle is most popularly known for its bizarre and unexplained disappearances of at least five people between the years of 1945 and 1950. Now let's get into the stories of the five people who went missing in the Bennington Triangle. The first of these disappearances happened on November 12, 1945, when 74 year old Mitty Rivers vanished. Mitty Rivers was actually a mountain guide and on the day of his disappearance, 
appearance, he was leading a group of four hunters up the Gladstonebury Mountain. Now, as a side note, the Gladstonebury Mountain has an elevation of 3,748 feet and is known as a relatively easy hike depending on the trail you take. And it is surrounded by multiple rivers and lots of greenery. That's just to kind of give you an idea of what the mountain was actually like the day that he was on it. But either way, when he was leading the group back to their campsite along the Long Trail Road area and Vermont Route 9, he got just ahead of the group just enough so that he was barely out of their sight. Within that very short window of time, he literally just vanished and was never seen again. Literally within seconds, he went from leading a group of four other men to never being seen again. It's very unlikely that he somehow just randomly got lost because he was literally a mountain guide who knew the mountain like the back of his hand and he was very experienced with navigating around the mountain and his job was literally to make sure other people were safe and other people were getting up and down the mountain okay. So what possibly could have caused him to just disappear like that? After he went missing, a search was conducted, but it turned up no sign of him anywhere. But people who knew him knew that he was, again, very knowledgeable of the area. He was a skilled woodsman and they thought that he would just be able to survive the elements and would reappear in the town a couple of days later. Of course, though, this is not what ended up happening. Soon after the disappearance, over 300 locals and U.S. Army soldiers trudged through the wilderness for eight days to search the area extensively, but came up with absolutely nothing. The next disappearance happened on December 1st, 1946, to an 18-year-old woman named Paula Jean Weldon. Paula was a sophomore at the Bennington College and was out for a hike on Long Trail to explore the mountain. She was seen heading to the trail by several people, including an employee for the Bennington Banner who gave her directions, drivers who gave her rides since she was actually hitchhiking for rides to the mountain, and other hikers who actually said that they were worried that she wasn't dressed warm enough to be hiking the mountain. There was also apparently an elderly couple who were about 100 yards behind her on the trail who also saw her. She was wearing a red coat that was very easy to spot, so when she walked by someone, they very easily noticed her bright clothes. According to this elderly couple, they saw Paula turn the corner on the trail, but by the time they reached that same corner, she was no longer there. So once again, she went from being seen by other people to completely vanishing within minutes. When she failed to show up for her classes at her college that Monday, a massive search was done on the mountain to find her. Over a thousand people combed the area and the FBI even got involved. They even posted a $5,000 reward for her safe return, but once again, they found absolutely zero trace of her anywhere. At the time of her disappearance, Vermont actually did not have a state police force. They only had a state investigator who was put on the case, and a lot of people, one including Paula's father, criticized the methods used in this case, which was actually what led them to putting together an actual state police force. But still, nothing was ever found, and no one has any idea of what possibly could have happened to her. Three years later, on December 1st, 1949, the third and probably the most bizarre disappearances of all occurred to 68-year-old James E. Telford. James was a veteran who was a resident of the Bennington Soldiers' home, and went to St. Albans to visit some relatives. When returning home, he rode the bus and witnesses saw James get on the bus, saw him still sitting on the bus at the stop right before the Bennington stop, but sometime between that stop and the Bennington stop, he literally vanished into thin air. Like people literally saw him sitting on the bus surrounded by a bunch of other people. No one saw him get up or get off or anything like that. They just saw him sitting in a seat one moment and the next his seat was just empty. His luggage was still in the luggage rack and there was an open bus timetable sitting on his seat. The time between him last being seen and the time when his seat was empty, the bus would have been driving down Route 7 through the Bennington Triangle. So that kind of 
explains why his disappearance counts as one of the Bennington Triangles because he did just happen to be in that exact area when he went missing from the bus. I literally cannot wrap my head around his disappearance. It's a real documented disappearance with multiple witnesses and obviously evidence that he was in fact a real person that went missing and not just a random story that someone made up. He literally just went poof and was gone and was just never seen again. Next, almost a year later on October 12th, 1950, the fourth disappearance happened to an eight-year-old little boy named Paul. Jepson. Paul was last seen by his mother just playing in the family pickup truck before his mother left for a little bit to go feed the pigs. She was only gone for about an hour, but by the time she got back to check on Paul, he was nowhere to be found. Once again, search efforts were immediately conducted, but there were no traces of him anywhere. When he went missing, he too was actually wearing a bright red jacket that would have made him very easily visible, but unfortunately that didn't help because he was never seen again. Now, apparently when investigators brought their sniffer dogs in, they tracked Paul's scent to a nearby highway where it just suddenly stopped. After multiple searches were conducted with absolutely no trace of him turning up, the attention was actually turned to the parents who were thought to have fed him to their pigs. However, during an interview, Paul's father said that in the days before his disappearance, Paul had actually been talking about the mountains nonstop, basically saying that he was just drawn to these mountains. He said that it was possibly the lure of these mountains that just pulled away his son and that's where he was when he went missing. I don't necessarily know how much I believe this though because I'm sure he's very aware of these bizarre disappearances that have been happening around the area and it almost just seems like he's pandering to the mystery of the mountains to deflect attention, but that's just me. Finally, just two weeks after that disappearance on October 28th, 1950, 53-year-old Frida Langer disappeared. This was the last of these five very bizarre disappearances. Frida Langer was an experienced hiker and a survivalist who knew the mountain and the trails extremely well. On the day of her disappearance, her and her cousin Herbert Elsner left the campsite near Somerset Reservoir where they and their family were staying to go on a hike on Long Trail. After hiking about a half mile, Frida actually fell into a stream, so she decided to head back to the campsite to change her clothes and told her cousin that she would be right back and catch up to him. Now her husband was still at the camp with a hurt knee, but Frida never made it back to the camp and never caught back up with her cousin. When Herbert realized that she never came back, he went back to the campsite and realized that her husband actually hadn't seen her either and neither had anyone else. Somehow, during the span of a half of a mile, she completely vanished without anybody seeing a thing. Of course, they started searching wherever they could, but they found nothing. Right away, there were several search efforts set to go out and find her. They used helicopters from the Connecticut Coast Guard and the U.S. Army, an aircraft from a local citizen, and had over 300 searchers. Despite the efforts though, no trace was found of her anywhere. Then unfortunately on May 12th, 1951, six months after her disappearance, Frida's body was actually found in the Somerset Reservoir. What was very strange though, was that this area had been searched extensively repeatedly for months after she went missing. Plus her remains were in such bad shape that they couldn't even determine her cause of death. So to me, it's unlikely that she would have just gotten lost and succumbed to the elements where she was found since she wasn't there until long after they had already searched the area. Frida was the last of these disappearances and was the only one who had been found. Now, some of the similarities between these disappearances are that they all happened within that five-year time span they were all in pretty much the same area. They were all pretty much during around the same time of day from three to 4 p.m. And they were all in similar times of the year, 
all being between October and December. However, other than that, there really aren't any connections between the victims themselves. They didn't know each other as far as we know. They didn't really have any commonalities in terms of looks. The age was pretty much all over the place. It really did seem completely random. So then we have to ask what possibly could be responsible for all of these crazy disappearances over such a short period of time. There are a ton of different theories and possible explanations, so let's go over those now. The first theory is that one person is responsible for all of these disappearances, that someone was going around picking these random victims and causing them to disappear. I don't wanna get demonetized, so I'm not going to say the exact words straight out, but you guys know what I'm talking about. So in this theory, people believe that an extremely skilled and successful individual was just taking people near the trail and by the highway. It would have had to have been someone who was extremely familiar with the area. One of the largest things that points to this theory is the fact that Frida's body was placed out in the open after it had been searched extensively. When it comes to Jean Weldon, she was hitchhiking to the trail, so it makes sense that she could have possibly met someone with bad intentions while doing so. Paul Jepson's scent was traced straight to the highway and then it just ended, which suggests that someone easily could have just driven by and picked him up. However, those are really the only factors to me that point towards this theory. Both Frida and Mitty went missing when they were around other people, other friends or family. They were only a short distance and time frame away from those people, so someone would have had to have been extremely fast, not make any sort of noise or a struggle, and gotten away without anyone seeing or hearing anything within a few seconds to a few minutes. That just doesn't seem possible to me. And like I said before, these victims don't follow any sort of pattern. Generally, when someone is going around and harming people, they look for people who are similar to their MO. They tend to have a type. It's very rare that victims are just chosen at random like this and are in such a broad span of ages and characteristics. An eight-year-old little boy, two elderly men, an 18-year-old woman, and a 54-year-old woman. It really doesn't get any more random than that. And I mean, I guess it is possible, but it just doesn't seem likely. I honestly don't think that one single person could be responsible for all of these different disappearances and be so sneaky and so fast that not a single person saw or heard anything between all of these different victims. So that leads me into the next theory, which is one of the largest theories in this case, which is that something paranormal or supernatural is responsible. Now, as we know, this mountain is very well known for being spiritual and mysterious. As far back as the 1700s, people were reporting seeing strange things all over this mountain. Obviously, some of these strange reportings that we discussed earlier do seem a little bit out there and maybe even a little bit unlikely, but a lot of people over the centuries have said that they all believe that this mountain is cursed. So of course, within this theory, a lot of people believe that some sort of evil spirits could be responsible. The main thing pointing to this theory is that these people seem to have just disappeared and that there is this extensive history of it being cursed. There have been people who have been buried there for centuries, so I'm sure it is legitimately haunted, but do I think that this is what is causing these people to go missing? I don't know. The main thing that points me away from this theory is that only three of the victims went missing from the actual mountain and the rest went missing in the town. Now, it has been said that the land around the mountain is cursed too, but I don't know. I just feel like if this was some curse that was going on on the mountain, that these disappearances would still be happening and it would never have stopped. Evil spirits and curses don't just go away for no reason. So unless there's something else at play that we don't know about, and I don't know a lot about the paranormal and ghosts and things like that. So maybe some of you can shed some light on that for me. But for now, I just don't think that this is the most viable theory. The next theory is that something extraterrestrial is 
is responsible. I think that this is a really strong theory because there is a little bit of evidence that points towards it. Like I mentioned earlier, there were reports dating back centuries that spoke of strange lights, weird sounds, and weird odors coming from the mountain. I just feel like those are signs of a possible UFO sighting and the fact that they date back so far makes me believe it almost a little bit more. Nowadays, we know that everyone pretty much knows about aliens and UFOs and can easily make up claims that they saw one, but the fact that these reports were from so long ago before they necessarily even knew about what a UFO might look like and they don't necessarily come out and say like, yeah, I saw a UFO, rather they just described what they saw and smelled and heard and it just so happens that we know that now to be associated with aliens and UFOs, I think that's pretty strange. I think in terms of the fact that they went missing in such a short period of time with no noise, no struggle, no evidence, no trace of them being left behind, that this is a very attractive theory. It's possible that they needed to gather human experience for whatever reason, so that's why they chose such a broad spectrum of different people, and then when they got what they needed, they stopped and moved on somewhere else. Of course, there's no real evidence supporting this theory or pointing to this theory. It's all just speculation. We don't really know. The one thing that I question with the extraterrestrial and paranormal theories is that why was Frida's body returned and how? I think we can all agree that her body was probably placed there sometime after the search, but if it wasn't a human who put her there, who was it and why? I do think that this could be a possible theory, but obviously there isn't any real evidence pointing towards it besides the fact that there just isn't any evidence. The next theory is that they all succumb to the elements or something similar to that. Now, like I said before, all of these disappearances happened in October, November, or December. Obviously, it would have been pretty cold during those months, especially when you're at a higher elevation on the mountain. Is it possible that some of these victims had suffered from hypothermia? When experiencing hypothermia, people might do something called terminal burrowing, which is a survival instinct that causes people to find a small space and remote and just huddle there for warmth. It can get the person out of the wind, provide some warmth, and slow the process of hypothermia. However, these behaviors only typically happen after hypothermia has already started, so by the time they go and hide and find somewhere to warm up, it's often too late. If some of these individuals went to hide in these small crevices, it would obviously make them extremely difficult to find in any searches. The other possibility when it comes to succumbing to the elements is that we all know that this town used to be a logging and a mining community. There are numerous unmarked mine shafts along the mountain and it could be possible that some of these hikers decided to go off trail and fell into some of these mine shafts. This can explain why these disappearances happened so fast and explain why they've never been found or really left any trace behind. So obviously the theory of succumbing to the elements does not fit for all victims, but it could provide some explanation for those that were out hiking at the time but as we know, not all the victims were out hiking at the time of their disappearance. So if we do choose to believe this theory, we have to further question what happened to James Telford who went missing off of a bus and Paul Jepson who sent ended on the highway and was last seen in his family pickup truck. Now, this leads me to my final theory. Now, I don't know if this is the most popular theory, but I think that it is the one that's most likely based on the facts and what we know and what we can see. I think that the most likely theory is that these disappearances are actually not connected at all. So within this theory, I would like to go over each victim and what I think could have happened to each person. First, we have Mitty Rivers. He was leading a group of hikers when he went missing. We knew that he was extremely familiar with the area and just the fact that he was leading others makes me believe that he wasn't experiencing hypothermia and I don't think that he would have gone off trail on purpose. Obviously, he was prepared to be hiking. It was his job to know what to do, so he would have been well-dressed and he wouldn't have gone off the trail because he was leading other people and there's no reason for him to want to go somewhere else if he's just trying to get the hikers back to their campsite. So to me, the only things that I could really see that are possible is maybe he tripped and 
that's what led him off the trail and he possibly fell into a mine shaft because of that or i mean he could have really been abducted by aliens i know it's crazy but just think about it for a second he again would never have left his group to randomly go off trail by himself again he was well dressed he was an experienced hiker so the only things that i can even fathom happening to him are him tripping or being taken but i don't know what do you guys think the next disappearance was paula weldon who went hiking by herself in that bright red jacket if we remember, there are some witnesses who said that they were concerned that she wasn't dressed warmly enough. I know that I saw in some sources that she wasn't 100% familiar with the mountain. Now, I'm not exactly sure how far up the mountain she made it or how long she was outside, but given the information that we know, she really could have suffered from hypothermia if she really wasn't dressed properly. And again, with the mineshaft theory, this could be possible. Both are possibilities for why no one was able to spot her bright red jacket when they were looking for her. Of course, there's always the alien theories within all of these victims, but I also think that if any of these victims were met with foul play, it is very possible that she was. I think that she could have been met with foul play because she was by herself. She was hitchhiking and the only people who really saw her like were right behind her and could account for where she was right before she went missing was this elderly couple who didn't actually know her personally. It's very possible that they could have mixed her up for someone else, someone else that was wearing a similar jacket to her. So with Paula, unfortunately, I do think that it is very likely that she could have met with foul play or that she succumbed to the elements. I think both theories are very possible. Now let's talk about James Welford. He is the most mysterious of all the five disappearances and honestly, there is no plausible explanation for his disappearance. If the witnesses are right, then he literally just disappeared into thin air out of his seat in front of several other passengers. I cannot wrap my head around this whatsoever and I really can't even come up with a theory for it. If he jumped out of the window or got off the bus or fell or whatever, someone on the bus would have seen something. Plus, he just left his luggage sitting in the luggage rack still and he left the pamphlet that he was reading sitting opened on his chair. I honestly don't know what to think of this and I don't really think I can come up with a theory that explains this whatsoever. It is possible that maybe someone is misremembering, maybe they did see him get off the bus, maybe he got off in a crowd, but they said that they saw him after this stop and then before the next stop, he was gone. So there's no way he could have gotten off the bus without it even stopping and no one have seen him. This honestly sounds like it's something from a movie and completely made up and it's just so completely unimaginable. I really don't know. So I want to know what are your guys' thoughts on this? The next disappearance is Paul Jepsen and I personally lean more towards his disappearance not being connected to the rest of them. Now, when I first read about his disappearance, it really did sound like a child abduction from a stranger. A stranger or someone in the neighborhood could have seen him playing alone in the truck and took advantage of that, knew his parents weren't gonna be around for a while, but after hearing how the dad claimed that he had been talking about the mountains and just seemed drawn to the mountains and said that the mountains just lured him to them, I get a little bit suspicious. If you're a dad who is concerned about your missing son, you'd probably jump to the most realistic theory that your child was probably taken by someone. But if you know what happened to them, you might just say whatever to take the attention off of you. I don't know, this might just be the skeptic in me, but giving all of these disappearances and everything that was happening and knowing how many people believe in these mystical stories and you know the spiritual history of the mountain it's very convenient that the dad said that paul was just drawn to the mountains i think it's very possible that the parents did do something to paul and then just try to use the mystery of the mountains as a cop out now i don't know anything about the family or who they are but the family dynamics but given what we know it just doesn't sit right with me so personally I think that either one of these possibilities could be what actually happened to Paul. Lastly, we have Frida Langer. 
This is another disappearance that is strange because she was only a half a mile out and had to go back to the camp to change her clothes. So I don't think that she would have had any reason to go off trail and want to just explore. I imagine that she was trying to go pretty quickly, so maybe she was just trying to take some sort of shortcut, but that's really the only way that I could see her going off of the trail. Now, I do think it's possible, again, that she was just trying to get back quickly. She wasn't really thinking she took the wrong trail and maybe fell that way. Maybe she thought she was on the trail because she just wasn't paying attention and then, you know, fell into an unmarked mine shaft that way. As for hypothermia, I don't think that it would have happened that quickly even after falling from the creek because again, she was only half a mile out. It wouldn't have taken that long to get back to the campsite. So I really don't think hypothermia is realistic in this theory. But we do know that she was alone for a couple of minutes. And even though it would have had to have been ridiculously fast, I think that she could have been abducted. It takes about four to five minutes to walk a half mile and it probably took at least 10 to 15 minutes for her cousin to realize that she didn't come back. And we know that of everyone who went missing, she was the only one whose body showed back up. So I think that while it's kind of unlikely, it could be possible that she was taken and harmed by someone again, given that there was a little bit more time compared to the rest of them for someone to have done something to her. I also think it's possible, again, that she may have accidentally gone off trail and fell that way. But again, just like with every other person, I really want to know what you guys think. So those are pretty much all the theories we have in this case. With the number of victims we have, along with the different places that they went missing, I think there are so many theories and possibilities that it's hard to come up with one that makes sense, especially if we want to say that they were all connected. That makes it even harder to come up with a theory that works for every single person. I personally think that it's possible that they aren't connected and that they disappeared by different means and that there were just a lot of very strange things going on in that short period of time that caused all of these different people to go missing. But again, as I keep saying, I don't know. What do you guys think? I honestly cannot wait to hear you guys' theories because this is such a mind-boggling case and you guys always come up with the best theories that I haven't even thought of, so make sure to leave your comments and thoughts below. But either way, that is all I have for today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Also, don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked in the description box below. If you wish to help support my channel, I did make a Patreon, which will be linked below. So please make sure to go ahead and check that out. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please do not hesitate to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I read every single case suggestion that I get and every single video I make are suggestions directly from you guys. I really hope you guys enjoyed this little mini series. I know I didn't make a video every single day during Halloween week, but I did what I could given the time that I have. So I really hope that you enjoyed these mysterious and spooky videos. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.